Have you ever wondered what motivates people to play a sport where you have to get up early in the morning, suffer the extreme cold, and risk potential injury? Well, I'm here with a couple of my friends to answer the question, why do we love the sport of hockey so much that we're willing to risk all of this just to play? Come with me and let's find out. We love the game. Uh, we really enjoy it. We go out there early in the mornings and we just really enjoy it. It's our passion. Uh, I remember my first goal like it was yesterday. It was so exciting. I was about 10 years old. Uh, the feeling that day was great. It made my day for sure. I really enjoy hockey uh, because I'm kind of a competitive person. I really like sports in general, but ice hockey is super fun. It's totally different from any other sport you play because it's, uh, it's on ice and it's high, high speed, high pace. I have a good passion for it. It keeps me sharp, um, you know, my brain and my body, you know. And it's, uh, it's I don't mind the cold and I, 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 I don't mind just getting out there and like, putting in the effort because I enjoy it. Hockey's a, a sport that sort of uses a whole bunch of different skills together, right? So skating is a big one. Like you need to know how to skate and you need to, you need to have speed, but you also need to have endurance. You need to be able to turn quickly. You need to be able to stop. These are all things you need to practice and it takes time to learn those things. It's hard going there when you don't want to, but I think when you're there, you just go into a totally different zone. You're there, you're in a different area, then you really enjoy it. You're just, you can put everything else behind you. One of the great things about doing something that you really enjoy is that you can focus 100% on that and you can kind of just tune out the other stuff that's going on, you know, in your life. It's a great tool for just, you know, being focused on something else for a little bit and, and not letting, you know, those things weigh you down all the time. So I think Jesus, to me, is very similar to hockey because uh, he's a, a great source of hope and where hockey kind of distracts me from my problems and that I have to focus 100% on that, Jesus helps me draw my focus away from my problems by giving me hope about the future. Uh, and through prayer and through reading his word, like uh, my problems, are, they seem so much smaller than they were before. A lot like the way you bond and really grow in understanding with your hockey teammates, I think uh, having a community of believers together who uh, really grow and kind of understand the struggles different people are going through, you really kind of learn each other's strengths and weaknesses and you can um, build off of that and really uh, benefit from, from knowing those different things and, and build each other up. You know, some people like watching movies, some people may like reading, some people like drawing, or just like hanging out with friends. And then I think he enjoys us to enjoy ourselves, even if that happens to be hockey. Praying strengthens my relationship with Jesus, and just focusing on him really helps me feel connected with him. I think communion is a way that helps me focus on Jesus. Um, it's sort of, uh, perspective reset because I think I you know I live a lot of my life not really thinking about the sacrifice Jesus made all the time you know but um, when I take communion it's a great opportunity for me to think back on that and think about the significance of that sacrifice and just be thankful for it and you know uh, remember to continue living my life in a way that reflects that. Welcome, we are so glad you're here with us. I know we've been going through a lot as a church community, um, but the one thing that we can count on is that God is still good. Is he worth praising? Is he worth singing to? That's the one thing we can agree on. So feel free to, to stand, to sing out, and to praise God this morning because he is worthy despite how we're feeling and he's with us. You have given us a new name As sons and daughters of your righteousness And you have taken all of our shame And given us the gift of holiness Lord, we're crying for faith to believe 
Isn't it so good to sing together? <sighs> and so, while we continue singing and believing that it is true that God is, is worthy to be praised, we are here this morning to praise him, to, to bless him with our voices, with these words. And so with this next song, let it, let it be our prayer, our prayer this morning to God, to give him our trust, give him our hearts, let him do what he wants to do in our lives and in our church.
take it all, my life in your hands. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Haley. I'm the earlier's pastor, which is probably why you've never seen me. I'm normally around the corner. Um, but they've asked me to pray a prayer that uh, was placed on my heart probably about four years ago after I walked a rather, I was actually in the middle of walking a rather difficult journey with you um, in my life. And so I'm honored that I get to share it with you guys this morning. So yeah, this is the prayer. The middle, the in-between, the not there yet, the uncertainty. This is where we discover who we truly are at, our core. And when and what our foundation is made of. We all know who God is until disappointment and tragedy happens. And then all of a sudden, we doubt him. When all the while, he never changed, life did. And in fact, he wasn't surprised. He sees the other side, even when we are struggling to see two feet in front of us. So we have a decision to make, to let him in, and to let him shape and form the ugly into something beautiful, or to shut him out and to lower our expectations of him because it's safer that way. The truth is, he never wavered. He has never changed, and he will never be moved. He never promised a smooth and easy road, but we were promised faithfulness, and we were promised grace that is more than enough. It's in the why season, the ugly season, the this does not make any sense season, when we are asked one question, who do you say I am? And our answer to that question is everything. I say amen to that. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. And giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I
Hello friends, welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Mark, I'm one of the pastors here at the Meeting House. It is so good to be together today. I know there are many places that you could be, many other things that you could be doing, and you are choosing, you have taken that step to be here uh, with us to, as you've heard, to worship, to praise, to uh, learn about Jesus, to become more like Jesus uh, in community together. And for that, um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I thank you. I'm excited to be together uh, in this way. Even though this um, is a little bit of a unique way to be together, I realize that we are together. Know that. This counts. Hey, we've got some um, exciting things happening around here. God is at work here at the Meeting House. And um, yeah, it, it feels like a privilege to be a part of that in this season of difficulty, in these kind of hard times. God is still moving. He's still at work. First of all, this morning, we're going to be hearing from Carmen as we continue our Road to Hope series. Uh, she will be talking about agree and agreeing and what that means as a community. Um, so she'll be diving into that. She'll be diving into the month of prayer as well. If you are interested in getting some of those resources and looking into that, you can still get those online. I know we've been talking about that um, quite a bit. You can go to themeetinghouse.com slash prayer to get those resources. They're all online, including something um, including something that we are calling our, our 24-hour uh, day of prayer. And it's not just something we're calling. It's actually a 24-hour day of prayer that we're doing. There's a sign up there. Carmen's going to be talking a little bit more about that. But please do dive into that. Uh, this is a season um, where we are preparing our hearts as we journey towards Easter. And we've been talking about this road to hope and, um, and recognizing that there are many stops along the way on our journey towards hope. And we are making those stops together. And what a better way to kind of acknowledge and grow and uh, journey than to do it together, because I think that's the only way that we can get there in all honesty. And so I'm thankful that you are joining us for that. And that is leading us towards our Easter weekend, and that is coming up. We will be having a Good Friday service right here, uh, same place, same location. You can go to the meetinghouse.com slash live to... Um, connect with us. That service is going to be at 10 a.m. Eastern, and then, of course, our regular Sunday service as well. So be looking for more information about that. I'm really excited about that service. Just an opportunity to come together and to recognize and to stare into uh, Jesus' sacrifice for us and what that means and how that plays a part, a major part, in our road to hope. Um, so looking forward to that. So, um, I have been finding encouragement this week in a verse in Habakkuk. Um, as you know, there are many things happening, and you heard a beautiful prayer by Haley during our time of worship there. Um, and these verses have been encouraging me, and I wanted to read them for us all together before we go on. Just um, give us an opportunity to pause, give us an opportunity to reflect um, on where we have our focus right now. And really, this is true for any season for us. Um, in any season, we can find ourselves distracted or uncertain or um, wandering over here or wandering over there. There are many things that take place, both good and bad, that can divert our focus from who Jesus is. And so I just want to read these verses. This is, this is in Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3, starting at verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. I just love these verses. Um... The author here is saying that everything around him is going poorly, right? There are no um, crops. There are no animals. Everything is desolate and dying around him. And yet, he will rejoice in the Lord, will be joyful in God, my Savior. And that is my encouragement to all of us today. Let us focus on Jesus, our Savior, let us find joy in him, whatever that looks like for us today. 
we have reason to be joyful. And that reason is our Lord and Savior, Jesus. It is true and it is good. The other uh, thing that I wanted to let us all know, something worth celebrating in the midst of this uh, pain, pain that's all around the world. As you know, I'm sure about this conflict in Ukraine, this war. And I recognize that there are wars happening all over the world right now in Syria, in Syria, in the DRC, in um, Yemen. And the list goes on. There are many. Um, our partner, World Vision Canada, is doing work in those places. They've got a program called Raw Hope where they go into unstable places uh, and do work on the ground uh, that is different than their typical programming that they can set up for years and years. It's kind of a rapid response team, if you will. And they are doing that in Ukraine. And as a result of our partnership and the generosity of this church, they have been able to give $25,000 um, to those places and to Ukraine and the bordering countries specifically. When conflict happens in places, there are many, many, many people that are impacted. Um, but we often hear about two. We hear about refugees, people who leave those countries, and we, we help and we support those as often as we can. And then there are the people who stay within the country, but they have to move. They're displaced as a result of the war, and those are called internally displaced people. Well, World Vision, through their Raw Hope program, is working with both of those groups of people. First of all, on the borders of Romania, the border of Ukraine and Romania, where millions of people have gone, they are um, supporting people there through programming, through teams on the ground, um, with food, support for shelter, blankets, heaters, essential items for babies and toys for children, uh, transportation for people who need it. And then in addition to that, child-friendly child -friendly spaces uh, so that they can um, have their psychosocial needs uh, met, where they can kind of process or begin to process what they've experienced. And then for those people who are within Ukraine, those kind of internally displaced people, like I mentioned, they're working with local organizations to do the same, create supports for shelter, things like mattresses, pillows, uh, bed linens, uh, cleaning supplies, temporary shelters, spaces for children and families. All of these things are so important. And they're happening partially uh, because of this community, because of this church. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that generosity. That is literally changing lives, impacting people on the ground who are so desperate for help. Giving is one of uh, the things that we do here Often, it's something we talk about regularly. It's a high value for us here at the Meeting House and as followers of Jesus. And if you want to partner with that, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash give to learn more. You can see it on your screen there. And you can partner uh, with the Meeting House and what God is doing through the Meeting House and with our partner agencies and organizations like World Vision Canada. So please do, please uh, go there uh, to partner. Okay, I am going to pray, and then we are going to hear um, from Carmen. Will you please join me in prayer? Oh, Father, we just come to you today with our hands open. Yeah, we say yes to you, Jesus. Lord, we think of those who are impacted by war and conflict all around the world. We think of those who are hurting, who are lost, who are uncertain about what to do next. Literally, their next uh, steps. Jesus, we pray that your Holy Spirit would draw near to them. We pray that you would be present uh, in their lives, that you could just hold them, that you could comfort them. Lord, we're thankful um, for the generosity of this community and ultimately, Jesus, for your incredible gen generosity in our lives. We just pray for more of that. We pray that we could um, look to you for our needs that we could recognize all of this as yours, and that we could hold our hands open to what you have um, for us and that the places that you would lead us. Jesus, we pray that we could stay focused on you in the midst of all the things happening around us, that you could be our guiding light, that you could be with us every step of the way and that you would reveal yourself to us through your Holy Spirit more and more and more, that we could know you, that we could sense you in our lives. 
In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. It was made for you. My yoke is easy. It was made to make human life human, as God dreamed and intended. It fits. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light, and you will find rest. Did you catch this? Rest. God's eternal Sabbath rest for your soul. Bishop Michael Curry An easy life isn't an option. An easy yoke is. John Mark Comer If I could pray no other word ever again, I would be okay. Amen speaks affirmation and commitment. It says yes to a lifestyle where he is to be trusted and I can rest in him. When I talk to God, I start with amen. And with it, we communicate intimacy and a sense of knowing. Beth Guckenberger To walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. John Mark Comer Desire is infinite partly because we were made by God, made for God, made to need God, and made to run on God. We can be satisfied only by the one who is infinite, eternal, and able to supply all our needs. We are only at home in God. Dallas Willard For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes, in Christ. And so through him, amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. Well, good morning, friends. It is so fantastic to be together today. And that last quote that we just ended on, keep in your mind as kind of the undergirding of where we're headed today as we talk about this idea of agree. So we're in the middle of our Road to Hope series, this Lent series, these days and weeks leading into Easter. We have intentionally tracked as a church in a a month of prayer together, and our teaching series is focused on the same themes that we've been tracking with throughout our week in our month of prayer. And so we land this week on the theme and the focus of agree. Now, I'm hoping many of you have already engaged with our month of prayer and have been tracking along, but just want to say, like as a promo, it certainly isn't too late. Man, if there was ever a time for our church collectively to be submitted together in prayer, isn't it not now? And so if you're, if you're newer or just haven't kind of caught up with where we're at, let me extend that invitation to join us in our Road to Hope month of prayer. And you can just head to themeetinghouse.com slash prayer. I didn't want to get it wrong. You can sign up. There are digital uh, resources there that have you tracking along with the themes and then the reflections. And then leading into Easter, we're actually doing a 24-hour uh, time of prayer where you can t- sign up for a prayer slot. And just want to encourage us as a church Let's lean into this time together. And so as I said, the theme for this week is agree. 
And so we're going to talk about this spiritual principle of agreeing with God. What does that mean? What does that look like? When we say we agree with God, what does that mean for how our life is oriented? What does that idea even mean when we stand up here and say we should agree with God? And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. And there is a deep spiritual significance to agreeing with God. It's more than a platitude. It's more than simply a nice thing that we know we should do as someone who follows Jesus. When we embrace the spiritual practice of agreement with God, there is a deep significance that can impact our lives, our trajectory, and how we under, come to understand a relationship with God. And Isaiah postures this so well for us. This is sort of the why in Isaiah 55, why it is important to agree with God. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we're reminded of this that the ways of God are different than our own and they are higher than our own. And if we believe this to be true, that the ways of God are higher than ours, then there's a spiritual discipline that we need to embody and embrace about agreement, in agreement with what God is doing and what God's intentions are for our lives and the life of our church. So we're just going to start with like, so what does that even mean to say we agree with Jesus? And simply put, if we were to kind of like reduce it to like, here's what I think it means, here's where we're headed, it's to simply make room for Jesus to do what Jesus is going to do. Now there's this analogy, it's so well known, I'm sure many of you have heard it from Stephen Covey, it's the idea of the big rocks analogy. Just like here in Oakville, I know people are watching on live stream and you're in your own parishes, do this as well. Like just, hey, show of hands, have you heard of the big rocks analogy before? Yeah, this isn't new. Clearly I can take zero credit for it, but just like to catch us up, just that principle of you have to start with the big rocks. If you have a bunch of things to fit in a jar, for example, if you start with the sand and then try to fit in the other thing than the little rocks, the big rocks are never going to fit. And you might look at that and think, well, they just have no more room left. But when you start with the big rocks, then the little pebbles slide in around, and then the sand pours in and fills all the crevices. And all of a sudden, you have the exact same content that can all of a sudden fit. And I think this is a beautiful analogy as we talk about agreement, because agreement simply means to start with God. So for, for, for lack of a better term in, the, in this teaching time, the, the ways of God can be seen sort of as our big rocks. When we start with him, then the rest of our life starts to be oriented around the intentions of what God has for us. The quote we just heard, I want to throw it up here again, I think it's so fantastic by Beth Guckenberger, says this, amen speaks affirmation and commitment. It says yes to a lifestyle where he is to be trusted and I can rest in him. When I talk to God, I start with amen, and with it, we communicate intimacy and a sense of knowing. Agreement is starting with amen. It's starting with that sense of whatever you want to do, God, do it. I present myself as open and with space for whatever it is you want to do. And so as we talk about what does it actually mean to agree with Jesus, here are a few principles I think can help us understand this concept. And that first one simply is to start with him. And we can do this because we know the truth that his ways are higher than ours. One of my mentors said just last week, Carmen, you're going through a tough time. We are as a church. There's some challenging days ahead. And one of the things she said, it's so simple, but she said, when you have nothing more to pray or things seem upside down and you don't know what to do, start your day just opening your agenda and simply saying, God, here's my day. I want you to be in it. Through everything that's represented through my meetings and the scheduling and then the kids' practices and then the meals and then the whatever, God, I want it to start with you. And so that's just a simple, practical example, but as we talk about how to live our lives and agree with what God might be up to in us, how are we starting with him? And maybe it's not opening your agenda and saying, I'm going to start this day with God, but maybe it's that posture in a season of life, in a week, in a time, to simply say, God, I can trust who you are and what you're up to enough to say, before I make any decisions, before I fill any of the crevices, I want to start with you. When we make room for God, 
he will fill it. However much room we're willing to give him, he in his goodness will fill that space. So a part of agreeing with Jesus is simply having that be our starting point. Another way that we can agree with God is to know his promises. We can start with the amen. We can start with saying, come and fill my life because we know his promises to be true. I want you to just take a minute and think about someone that you know that has proven themselves to be true to their word. Whether that's a family member or a colleague or a customer service rep, think of a time or think of an experience when someone you know is just that kind of person that embodies that character of being true to their word. And when you have their face in your mind, think about how much more willing you would be to agree to do what it is they ask of you or request of you or promise that they'll do for you. Our posture is so much easier to to be inclined to go along with where they're at because we know who they are and we know that they're true to their word. How much more can we know that to be true of God in his promises? Because we know the ending, when God says that he will do something, he will do something. And we see this peppered all through scripture. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Lamentations for just a minute. It's one of my favorite passages. I think this is a beautiful example of agreement with God. Lamentations 3, it's a well-known passage, 19 to 24 says this, I remembered my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I will remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, and therefore I will wait for him. Here we have the author of Lamentations, the prophet, recalling a deep, dark season. I remembered my afflictions, the bitterness, the gall. I will remember them. My soul is downcast within me, painting such a picture of heaviness and sorrow and challenge. And here is the most beautiful word. And I think this is the picture of agreement that we need to hold on to. In verse 21, that first word is yet. Yet this I call to mind. Despite the circumstances that the author is experiencing, they are able to agree with who God is and what God is up to because they know the character of God. They know the promises of God. God, verse 22, again says, because of your great love, because you're compassionate, because uh, you, you never fail, because of these things, I know that you are good, and it says, and I will wait for you. You are my portion, and I wait for you. Because of who you are and your promises, I can agree with you. I'll make room for you. And I think this is so key to us being able to agree with God. Knowing the promises allows us not to fall into the temptation of saying, whether my circumstances are good or bad, but just being able to say, and yet, I agree. And so my encouragement to you as you think about what it means to agree with God is to think, how, how, do you, how well do you know, how deeply do you embrace the promises of God for you? Perhaps something you need to do is spend some time this week meditating on, being reminded of, looking for the promises of God that you know to be true in your life and allow them to be what shift your posture into a posture of agreement to say, despite this or in light of this, I know this, and therefore, God, I make room for you to do what you need to do. As you saw in the quote, 2 Corinthians tells us that all of our promises are fulfilled in Jesus. All of his promises, all of the promises of God are yes and amen. There is a model of agreement laid out for us in Jesus, and we just need to know his promises, and that's another way we can be in agreement with Jesus. And finally, another thing that we can do that helps us start with our amen, is just a renewing of our minds. Agreeing, as we talk about the spiritual practice of agreement, agreement is an active practice. It's not passive. We actually get a role to play, and Scripture tells us this. Scripture invites us to, you can see two passages there, renew our minds and then think on good things. Being in partnership with Jesus 
means realizing that we have a role to play as we come into agreement with him and to center on the thoughts that are his and to reorient our lives in a way that focuses on him. And in a minute, we're going to talk about the ways that we have barriers or things that might stop us from living a life of agreement. But know that as we step into this spiritual practice, we have an invitation to have our minds renewed, to be shifted, to be more like Christ. And one of the ways to do that comes from that Philippians passage. Think on things that are good and right and noble and pure. And when we do these things, we start to see that our lives become more oriented towards agreement in Jesus. And, and here's the thing. This, there are spiritual shifts that happen when we agree. Because I think sometimes we think, okay, this is hard to do. I'm told I'm supposed to sit and start my day with God, and okay, I guess I'll do it. It's not just a checklist on our list of things to do. When we live a posture of agreement, when we live a life of agreement, things start to shift. So while we have a role to play, we have a role to say, I want to renew my mind. I'm going to intentionally think on things that are good and noble and pure and true. Something incredible happens that's beyond our human capacity. Because there is a spiritual shift that takes place. And there are some examples in scripture, and if you're in a home church, uh, you're gonna, I'm encouraging you to actually think about what other examples do you see. You can see on the slide there just a few examples that come up um, when we do this. So one of them, James tells us that when we resist the devil, he will flee from us. When we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. When we do our part to say, I'm starting with agreement, something shifts and work happens that's beyond us. So we say, I agree with you, God, by resisting the devil. And then beyond our control, the Bible tells us and promises us he will flee from us. Another example there that you can see is that when we seek, we, uh, yeah, when we ask for wisdom, James 1.5 tells us if we ask for wisdom, God is good and gracious and will give it to us. That part is beyond our control. But when you step into a posture of agreement, for example, and say, I want the wisdom, God, that you have to give me, a shift happens and it's, it's provided. And then Matthew 6 tells us when we seek first God's kingdom, when we start with agreement, when we start with saying, first and foremost, God, I seek you, our, our desires start to be more shifted and oriented to look like those of Christ. So you see, when we live a life of agreement, there are pieces that we can choose and actively lean into, and then the beautiful thing about the power of God and the power of his spirit is that shifts start to happen. And there's examples of these all through scripture. There's just a few, but there is a deep spiritual significance, like I said at the beginning, about living a life in the spiritual discipline of agreement. And so just wanted to lay that foundation as we continue this morning, as we talk about what does it mean to agree with Jesus? It means that we make room for him. It means that we say, God, we know you are true to your promises, and therefore, before I even know the outcome, I can make space for you to be first in my life. And the beautiful thing is when we do that, there are spiritual shifts that come beyond our control. But let's be honest, this is easy to talk about up here, but it doesn't always happen. There are ways and spaces and times that we don't start with a posture of agreement. At least I'm hoping so, because I know certainly for me that's the case, and I really hope that I'm not alone in that. So I want to just take a few minutes and talk about what are the things that stop us from starting with agreeing, from letting that amen be the very first thing in our life. And I picked three. I don't think it's reduced to these three. If you're following on the, along in the teaching notes, you can see them laid out for you there. Just briefly want to touch on these. I think uh, cultural norms, our schedule, and our identity are often three barriers to us fully stepping into starting with our amen and starting with a life centered on Jesus. Cultural norms tell us to start with our responses and reactions. Cultural norms often tell us to either pick a side or to stay current or to know what's happening, but often, not always, but often, this rushes us past the unhurried pace of Jesus. My goodness, we wouldn't have to take long for each of us to sort of uh, come up with an inventory of potentially some of the cultural norms that we're experiencing in our society these days. Things are, it's a constantly shifting landscape, isn't it? whether it's pandemic controversies, or war controversies, or what's going on in your neighborhood, or what's, what's going on in uh, the world when it comes to race and diversity, 
And those are very important things to be engaged with and thinking about, but cultural norms tell us, start with your reactions. Start with your responses. And I do think that oftentimes that rushes us past the pace of Jesus. It rushes us to say, I gotta figure this one out on my own. Let me think about what I think. Let me do this. Instead of saying, let me start with trust in you. Surrender in you. Making room for you. I wonder what that would do to uh, our, our internal peace and our internal urgency if when faced with the norms that culture throws at us, left, right, and center, if our starting point was to say, Jesus, here's it, here is it. I want to start with you. So I think cultural norms play a role in our barrier to agreeing. And tied to that, but in a different shift, I think our schedules do too. And I'll be honest with you, transparently, I thought, I, I hesitated to put this one in here because it seems a little bit flat, if I'm being honest. It felt like, really, we're going to talk in a sermon about our schedules? But I actually felt really compelled to put this in here because it's so tied to our culture. Have we made room? Have we made room in our everyday, ongoing, ordinary uh, life? Have we made room? Trusting that God has things to do in us and through us And that means we have to be open and ready. And maybe I'm speaking this from just my own experience, and I apologize if there's no translation to each of you, but so often my day starts hurried and right away and just continues that way right until I drop in bed at night. And my day includes time in scripture and prayer most of the time, but it's fit in. And I wonder if we had a posture to say, God, we believe that you have big and good and important things to do in us and through us for the goodness and the movement of your kingdom, if that would give a little bit of space to how we live our lives. There was a quote in our quotes package that says this, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. And that's John Mark Comer. And he says, hurry is the death of prayer. And I think you could say, hurry is the death of prayer, which in one sense means hurry is sort of the death of agreement. To trust that God is going to do what God's going to do means we need to make space and needs to make room. And then thirdly, I think our identity so often gets in the way of living a life of agreement with God. There's, oh man, there's so much to be said about agreement and how it shapes us and how we see ourselves with Jesus. Friends, full stop, we are full and free children of God. That is our identity. But so often we're pulled into all the other identities that we hold, the roles we hold, the labels we hold on to, and when we do that, it pulls us away from being able and willing and trusting to let God do what God wants to do because we become distracted and hurried and filled with the pressure to fulfill everything that everyone else wants us to be. Filling ourselves with pieces other than what God wants to do had we made the room and made the space for him first. So cultural norms, our schedule, and our identity. I want you to just take a minute and say, does any of that ping for you as a, as a component that maybe prevents you from living a life in a posture of agreement? And maybe it's not those three, but maybe it's something else. But want to say, what does get in the way? Because there certainly are things that stop us from fully living in a posture of agreement with Jesus. All right, I want to shift a little bit to talking about what does it mean when we agree with Jesus to kind of looking at that concept of a spiritual practice of agreement as a church. What does it mean for us to agree with God as a church? And we know that we are in a unique and really, really tough season as a church. And what I'm about to name, when we're talking today about this focus of agreeing with Jesus, that's not meant to skim over the weeks we've had, the weeks we have yet to have, the questions we have to answer, the conversations we have to have as a church. So please, just see today's input as another component to all that we're holding in this season. Part of that, like Jimmy did an incredible job last week inviting us as a church to consider what do we need to repent of? collectively, individually, but then collectively as a church. That is still so important, and this isn't meant to skim over any of that. 
But I want to add agreement to that list because I think there are some things for us to consider as a church about what it means to agree with God, about how to make room for what God wants to do in this church, in these days and in the days ahead, because we are in a new season. Things are never going to look like they used to look. And as we process some big things in our church, as we process the removal of Bruxy, and as we process the new news of the transition of Daryl moving on, we have to recognize that we are in new territory, aren't we? And we have some work to do as a church to agree and make room for God. And so as we kind of transition to the nearing the end here, I want us to look at the story of Joshua for just a minute. And so if you're tracking in your Bible, whether on your phone or you have your Bible, you can turn to Joshua 1, because this is another example of a community that was entering new territory. And in Joshua 1, the first six verses say this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So things are never going to be the same for the Israelites either. They too have experienced loss and transition, but they're on the cusp of the new thing that God has promised them. God says, I will give you every place that you set your foot and that I promised to Moses. Did you catch that, the promise? We talked about promises earlier. God made clear promises to the Israelites, and he says, and I will be with you, so be strong and courageous. And what do the Israelites do? They agree. They agree with God. They say, whatever you've commanded, we will do. And by following Joshua, they say a little bit later in chapter one, we know that you are following the Lord, and so we follow you. There is a posture of agreement to what God has yet to do. And they can do this because they know and trust the promises that God has given them. And yeah, I just want to name the entire book of Joshua. It's not an easy road. And there are some pretty hard passages to digest if you continue with the story of Joshua. And that's not the point of where we're going today, but I would encourage you to spend some time processing that. But the beautiful part of the journey of the Israelites is even in the midst of leadership loss, even in the midst of transition, they started with their amen. They started with saying, God, we trust that you are going to do what you said you were going to do. And because they made room, because they walked out in obedience, they got to experience God in their midst in ways that were beyond what they could have ever humanly done. They experienced spiritual shifts that come with agreement. And near the end of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 21, it says this, nearing the end of the story that's captured through the book, not one of all of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. And so as we briefly look at the story of Joshua and look at the way that they held a posture of agreement and the journey that God had for them as they made room, they experienced the fulfillment of the promises God had for them. And the same is true of you as a follower of Jesus and the same is true for us as a church. And so I invite us to have a posture of agree, to say to God, we know your character And we know your promises, and to say then that we will agree with whatever it is you want to do in us and through us as a church. And so we're going to close with a song, um, and the band is going to come out in a minute. And I want us to consider this a continued part of our teaching. I know sometimes we have a practice as a church, we have these habits as a church, and they're beautiful. To say we end with teaching, and then we sing a lovely song, and we go... But this right here, beyond any word I've said, want this to be a space where we start with our amen. 
to say, God, in this moment as a church, we want to be a people that make room for you. We want to be a people that trust you more than we want to rush to reaction and response. We want to know your character and trust your promises so much that whatever we have to bring to you, ache, hurt, anger, confusion, grief, excitement, whatever it is for us as a church, we can start with you and make room for you. And whatever room we make for God, he is going to fill. And so use these minutes as we end to ask God, God, what do you have for me? And what do you have for us as a church? Maybe you need to consider what are the barriers that stop me from agreeing? But can I also ask that we use this time as collective discernment to hear from God to say, what do you have for us as a church? And and if you hear something, can you please make sure you connect with your parish pastor? Connect with someone and say, I think I heard this. And then we will beautifully receive that with collective community discernment, of course. But let this be a time to start with a posture of agreement, and this will be our prayer as we close. the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better yeah your way is better and shake
is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. be our surrender this morning. Amen. Wow. How beautiful. I love that, that idea that when we make room for God, he fills it, right? Sometimes we find ourselves wondering, well, how can I hear from God more? Where is he leading me? What does he want? Right? And I think sometimes, sometimes it's as simple as making room for God and allowing him to fill that space. Thank you, Carmen, so much. That was so, um, yeah, so meaningful. Hey, if you are looking for a place to connect, if you are looking for a place to process some of these things that we're hearing, um, the teaching, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash homechurch. Uh, that is an opportunity to come together and to walk through life together to uh, process these things, to ask the questions, to wrestle um, with our faith together in a group. There are uh, home churches that meet specifically online, kind of all over the world. There are home churches that meet in person, close to parishes, wherever those are located. So I just want to encourage you that now is the time. If you've never been a part of a home church, uh, why not try now? Hey, it has been good to be together, friends. Looking forward to next time. We'll see you then. Go in peace.